morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to Inside the Writer's Studio, the podcast where we talk with writers about their lives, their craft, their business, and their latest work. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and our podcast is sponsored by Bookmarks. Bookmarks is a literary nonprofit whose programs include the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas. Come visit Bookmarks at our community gathering space and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Inside the Writer's Studio is also proud to be an affiliate of Libro FM, the audio book platform that supports your local independent bookstore. Stay tuned at the end of the podcast for more information on Libro FM and a special offer. My guest today is Kyle Lukoff, whose middle grade novel, Different Kinds of Fruit, has just been published. Kyle, welcome to Inside the Writer's Studio. Thanks for having me. So Different Kinds of Fruit is a middle grade book that features queer and questioning characters. I feel like we, to me, I feel like we live in a society right now that on the one hand, desperately needs this sort of book, and on the other hand, is in places pushing back against this sort of book. Um, why do you think books like this are are especially important right now? And and what do you think we can do to sort of help people who are maybe pushing against that to understand that importance? It's always hard for me to talk about books as being important because mm-hmm. my background is as a bookseller and a librarian. And my number one goal is to write books that people want to read because they like them, because they like the story, because they like the plot. I want people to read my books because they are curious about the questions that I'm asking and interested in the answers that I'm exploring. I don't want people to read my books to understand a large population of people or realize that some human beings are also human beings. To me, that is not I mean, number one, that's not the job of literature. And number two, that is just not something that I'm especially interested in exploring. I do think that my books can be useful in a variety of political contexts. For one, I know that they will they are certainly being seized by my opponents as examples of, you know, the kind of like filth and obscenity that our children are being exposed to. And I also know that they are being used by families with trans kids, by families with queer people in them as proof that we are also worthy of stories and that we are also worthy of being present in art. Um, You had a second part to your question. Um, Well, I mean, it was just with with the pushback, is there a way for us to to, you know, help people who are less receptive to this sort of book understand you know, the importance of all of us being allowed to see who we are on the page of a story? Well, I think it depends on the person. I think some people might just be unfamiliar with stories that they might, in fact, be interested in. Mm -hmm. I think some people might see queer stories as niche or as overly specific. And for those people, I would say, I mean, I don't even know what I would say. Like, you get to read what you want to read. And you don't have to read what you don't want to read. For people who are predisposed to see any books with LGBTQ people as inherently harmful to children and society, I there is nothing that I would say to them. And I also do not know how to single-handedly fight back a rising tide of fascism and white supremacy, which is what this represents. I do not know how to do that. I do not know how to convince these people that I am also a human being. And I don't want to, because again, I have better things to do with my time uh, than discussing what they see as my lack of humanity. Yeah. Uh, you've chosen to write, your your um, protagonist is a sixth grader. Um, and so that sort of puts this firmly in the, what the book industry calls the middle grade books, um, which is a, is a category that I'm super excited about because I have my first middle grade book coming out later this year. Oh, that's um, exciting. And but I wonder what what appeals to you in particular about writing for for um, for that age group? Well, I just like writing. Mm -hmm. I have not written for I have not written young adult yet, mostly because I don't work with teenagers and it's been a while since I've been a teenager. So that experience is less familiar with me. But I have worked with babies relatively recently. I've worked with fir- first graders relatively recently. And I've worked with fifth graders relatively recently. And I'm also a, an adult. So those are all <laughs> different ages that I feel confident and comfortable writing for because I know what it's like to be an adult. And I'm also very comfortable in 
the sort of like children's education world. Um, I like writing, I don't know, I like writing through the sage because I like writing. I think that each, each genre of book or each like developmental level of book provides its own challenges and opportunities. And something that I like about middle grade is that it lets me sort of tap into that, that consciousness where you're both very aware of yourself and the world around you, but you're also very confused by everything. And you're trying to both incorporate what you are being told is reality and also create your own kind of reality. Like I remember when I was a kid, I was just confused all the time by everything, which is I think a very common childhood experience. Like kids don't know how to tie their shoes. Kids don't know how to pack a good lunch for themselves. And I think that the answers that kids come up with to these questions that we are already familiar with can be really innovative and fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I think about myself as a sixth grader, um, which was, I hate to say it, almost 50 years ago uh, that I was in the sixth grade. But I grew up at a, at a time where I couldn't open a book and see a gay character, a lesbian character, a non-binary character, a trans character. And that that lack of representation um, did not serve me well when I, as I grew up and my best friend in college was gay and my child is non-binary and, you know, um, and so it, it thrills me to see a, a book like this on, on the shelf. What role do you think books, stories, reading play or should play in, in a child or for that matter, an adult's sort of search for identity? It's hard to answer that question because for me, I've only ever liked books. Like I was an extremely bookish child. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I still, when I have time, I try to read a book a day because I'm a fast reader. And I got hired at Barnes Noble when I was 16. And I then I worked in I worked in a school library for almost a decade. So my entire life is books. So asking like, why is it important, why is it important to read is just a baffling question because I <laughs> literally don't know how else to live. Um, but I think that there is in some, I think there are, I think that there are some schools of thought that believe that books for any person, but especially books for kids are part of like a well-balanced moral diet that books sort of function as like nutrition of the mind or that books are like prescription medication that if you you know give someone the right book they will come away with the correct ideas and they will then go forth and act correctly and I think you can see that in a lot of books with strong morals in them and then you also see that when adults say what's a good book for teaching my kid how to share or what's a good book for teaching my kid about different groups of people and I think that that misunderstands both the function of literature and also the ways that people and children are people mm -hmm. interact with literature, right? Like you bring to a book everything that you are and everything that you know and everything that you've experienced. And what you take from that book is dictated by who you are, what you know, and what you've experienced. And that is not something that I can control in any of my readers or any individual human being. So while some people might read different kinds of fruit and say like, wow, I'm just like Bailey, that's so cool. And they'll come away with that sense of like having seen a character like them in a book. There are also people who might read my book and think like, wow, Seattle seems like such a weird place. I can't wait to go. And then they're just fascinated by the city itself. And the characters have sort of gone over their head because that's not especially interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that, you know, when I was in, I want to say middle school, like seventh grade, I was obsessed with this book called Autobiography of a Face by Lucy Greeley, which is a memoir of this poet who later died uh, and her experience with cancer of the jaw and then multiple plastic surgeries to repair her jaw. And that book got to me like very few books ever have. I read it over and over and over and over again, despite the fact that, you know, my parents are Irish. I've never had cancer. I had never had surgery at that point. You know, my life experience couldn't be more different from this character, but something about the way she put words together just hit me. And I think that my book will hit for people for reasons that I can't explain. Yeah. And it won't hit for reasons that I can't explain. I think it's fascinating listening to you. I, I am thinking about, you will see the giant Alice in Wonderland poster behind me. But, you know, this dichotomy that we had in in the 19th century between the didactic stories of Lewis Carroll's childhood and then the stories that he wrote, which were just 
It's supposed to be, here's a fun story, react to it however you want to react to it. Um, and and to, to think that we're still kind of have almost that same dichotomy in terms of the way people approach books is, um, is fasc fascinates me. Um, it's, it's perhaps not absolutely universal um, that middle grade books use the first person. For instance, my forthcoming one does not. But I feel like the first person is, is maybe more often used in middle grade books than in just about every, any other level. Why did you specifically choose that for this book um, for your protagonist, Annabelle? And, and why do you think it works particularly well to, to tell this story? I originally started writing this book in the third person mm. when I first sat down to draft it. The opening scene where Annabelle and her dad are in Seattle watching the sunset was exactly the same. But I wrote it where this, you know, sort of unnamed, fairly voiceless narrator was just describing the actions. And it was deeply boring and just dull beyond imagining. And I thought to myself, wow, I don't know how to write books anymore. I guess I wrote one good book and I don't have any left. Oops. And I kind of put it away for a while, hoping that something eventually clicked or that maybe I would reread it and it wouldn't be quite as bad. And then this is kind of embarrassing, but I found myself either writing a Facebook post or responding to someone on Facebook. And I slipped into this voice that I only ever used on Facebook, which was like long, somewhat breathless sentences with a lot of ands and buts, uh -huh. where I like sort of breathlessly described something fairly mundane. And I really enjoy, I really enjoyed writing in that voice. And I thought to myself, man, I wish I could write a whole book using just that one voice. Yeah. And then I realized that I could because I had to write a new book. <laughs> and so I decided to rewrite the first paragraph using this like breathless, fast, long sentence, not quite stream of consciousness voice. And that's what cracked it for me. So yeah. this specific book had to be first person because Annabelle's voice demanded it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Annabelle, your, your sixth grade protagonist, and, and especially how we find her at the beginning of the novel. Yeah, Annabelle is delightful. She is an extremely effervescent child. She is full of energy and full of curiosity and full of questions. So she's very extroverted, but she also has sort of an unending internal monologue where she's just constantly churning things over in her brain, trying to figure out what is going on and trying to predict the future. And also, you know, there's, there's a scene where uh, other kids in her class are like, saying what they did over the summer. And she's like, and she's thinking to herself, sorry, I'm not listening to any of you because I'm too busy rehearsing what I'm gonna say. And then after I say it, I'm gonna spend the rest of the time thinking about what I said. So I'm not listening to any of you guys, really sorry about it. Um, so she has that like very fast paced internal monologue. Um, she is also desperate for her life to become more interesting than it is. But then when it does, she's not quite sure that she likes it. I, you know, that scene that you just mentioned where they're they're going around the circle, I think that was the one where where it just got me in terms of absolutely drawing me into the story. Because we've all been there. We've all been that thing where your turn's coming up and you're not paying attention to the other people because you're so worried about what you're going to say, whether it's, you know, no matter what the situation is, children, adults, we've, we've all had that that experience. Um, one of the things I, I notice about um, a lot of middle grade books is sometimes the parents end up kind of on the sidelines. You were, you were writing about a time period when, when kids are starting to have more independence and, and they're, um, there's definitely a, a trend towards, you know, adventures for, for independent kids. I mean, you think about even, even things like the Harry Potter series, you have the teachers, but the parents are kind of, you know, off in the background and, and rarely mentioned. But as you said, this book begins with a scene between Annabelle and her father and really her relationship with their parents is kind of the first relationship you establish in, in the book, why, why did you want that um, relationship central and, and established sort of right up front before you even showed us her with her peers? It is because in many ways, in many ways, this middle grade novel that I wrote that centers an 11 year old girl and her new crush slash best friend who's also 11 years old was in some ways a way for me to explore this perspective that I've been fascinated by and exploring in my work for a really long time, which is intergenerational conflict when it comes to transgender men who are about 10 to 15 years older than me. Mm -hmm. That is a group of human beings that I have been very interested in even before I came out as trans. 
And so that, you know, that sort of, it doesn't really spoil it for you because the, you know, promotional material for this book is pretty clear that Annabelle's dad is trans, yeah. but that he doesn't reveal that until pretty early on. So I had to immediately establish him as a character so that you knew going into this book who were the primary characters, that it was mostly Annabelle and her dad, mm -hmm. and that everyone else is sort of these two people on their journey together. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I love the, the family dynamic that, that you create and um, the, the dad and the mom are very different, have very different personalities. I mean, aside from other, other aspects of, of them, but t talk a little bit about that, about, about the way dad interacts with her versus the way mom interacts with her. I think in a lot of ways that reflects their two different experiences with navigating their queer identities. Yeah. So for dad, he has this extremely traumatic experience during a very vulnerable, a very vulnerable point in his life where this community that he really saw as like his family and his brothers suddenly cut him off and excommunicated him. And I think that the trauma of that informed informs everything about him in this book. It informs his relationship with his daughter. It informs his relationship with his wife. It informs his job. It informs his inability to make friendships, really. And it's not the fact that he's stealth. Like, you can not share that you're trans with people and not have this, not have that worldview. But he was forced into this by this feeling of excommunication from his community. Whereas his wife, whereas Annabelle's mom didn't experience it in the same way. She decide she sort of had to go with him in she she was not cut from her community as violently as he was yeah. she was because he was um but she didn't have the same experience of losing her community in a in like a sort of a sharp instant the way he did yeah. and so that informs her like more like warmth and openness and comfort um, you, you talked about Annabelle as, as one who asks a lot of questions. I just love the questions that she asks, whether they're out loud or, or in her head. Um, and one that particularly struck me is, and I'm quoting here, she says, is there some magic point where you become an adult and stop feeling like a kid? Uh, you know, I'm 59 years old and I'm waiting for that point to happen. But, you know, uh, but how do you, I, I'm curious, how do you feel that question relates, first of all, to your book, but also to kind of middle grade fiction in general? Is that, is that, a, is that a question that the, that the genre kind of explores a little bit um, and, and how do you explore it in your book? I have not, I have not seen that question posed that way very often. I'm sure I know that I'm not the first person to articulate this in a middle grade novel, yeah. but I don't see it very often. I mm -hmm. do often see characters who want to be perceived as more mature than they are and who like try to seem older, but that question from Annabelle really reflected how I felt as a kid. I often had these sharp moments where I was like, oh, I am a child and I'm behaving this way because I'm a child and I do not like that. I sure hope this changes. And I think Annabelle has these flashes where like she is for the most part, just like, you know, embodied and present in her life but then she has these moments where she realizes that there's more to the world than what she's able to access mm -hmm. and the her sort of feeling like both a child because she is and also someone approaching maturity because she is I think is also very uh I guess I I was gonna say special to middle grade but I don't even know if I believe that I think that even very young children are sometimes like oh I I am not able to fully experience this because I am too young for it yeah. and I think that there are teenagers who also are sort of able to demonstrate that sort of metacognition of saying oh I'm an adolescent and if I was 10 years older I might not be responding this way but I am 15 so my hormones are just all over the place. <laughs> I, I have a an adult friend who once told me that he really missed the feeling of sort of a blank slate at the beginning of a new school year. And this novel starts more or less at the beginning of the school year. I mean, we have a little bit of stuff that happens before the, the, the first day of school, but that's kind of the the reason, I think, chronologically for starting it where it does. How, how do you use that idea of the blank slate um, with, with Annabelle sort of approaching her new school year? 
Yeah, well, that's a good question. You ask really good questions. <laughs> um, so Annabelle in some ways sees the start of the school year as a blank slate because it's the beginning, it's new. You've got new clothes and you've got new binders and you've got a new classroom and a new teacher. But she's also aware that she's at the same school with the same classmates. And she's like, there's no way that this is really gonna be that different for me. And so she's putting all of her energy into focusing on middle school, which is when she really hopes that everything is different because she's just bored. She's been at the same place for you know the past, six years or however long, six or seven years. And I wanted to play with that idea of what, how do we make the familiar unfamiliar? And what, what sort of like secrets have been hiding underneath this facade the whole time? Um, yeah, I didn't really think about it as like the blanks. Like I mostly started at the beginning of the school year because that's when it makes sense for a new kid to show up. Yeah, yeah. And and so let's talk about that new kid. Anna, Annabelle comes to school on the first day. She expects it's going to be all the same kids, this teacher who's been teaching there forever. And she discovers to her delight that there's a new teacher and that there's a new kid, the, the I think, brilliantly named Bailey Wick. Um, what t- Tell us about Bailey. So I picked the last name Wick as a joke because I was like, oh, Bailey Wick, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. I'll change that eventually. And then I never <laughs> changed it. So it's just Bailey Wick. Why not? Maybe their parents did that on purpose. That's possible. Um, So I really wanted to establish Bailey right off the bat as being perfectly fine because in a lot of books, a character who is like queer or trans or non-binary or whatever is introduced as the potential site of conflict where the entire book will revolve around like people understanding and people accepting. And I don't find that to be an interesting narrative. So I wanted Bailey to immediately show up and be fine And more than fun, I wanted them to be cool. I wanted them to have cool clothes and I wanted other kids to want to be their friend. And I wanted them to, you know, confidently talk about themselves, maybe be nervous because it's normal to be nervous, but to have everyone be like, oh, this kid seems cool. I'm just going to go with it. Um, And they grew up on Capitol Hill, which is actually where we're, I'm recording this right now. Yeah. And I came in town for the launch party. So I've been walking around saying, oh, I wonder if Bailey grew up there. And I saw like <laughs> white pole, you know, thickly papered over with advertisements. And I was like, Annabelle saw one of those. That's that's what she was looking at. This is now the other thing. The other challenge that you have, I think, when you when you have a classroom full of kids. And this is actually the second book in a row I've read that has a classroom full of kids first one was fifth graders, but you, you have the same challenge that, that this novelist who was writing a novel for adults had. And that is you've got to introduce like nine or 10 characters all at once. Um, Cause she walks into that classroom and you've got to, for the readers, you've got to differentiate, differentiate those characters. How, how did you, how did you deal with that challenge of, you know, creating a whole classroom full of characters, but making sure that they were, they were individuals and they were people that we could sort of keep separate in our minds as as readers? In my mind, I came up with a tier of importance of Mm -hmm. the tertiary characters. So first, I just, I I came up with the number somewhat arbitrarily, but it's essentially based on the school that I worked at up until 2020. And so in my head, I was like, all right, so there's going to be a couple of kids that are going to matter. And then there's going to be a few kids that that are going to provide like entertainment value. And then there's going to be a few kids that like, barely exist I just say their name because I think that that if because I'm not trying to write a novel about this entire class of kids it would be distracting if each one of them had you know a fully developed plot arc but I also didn't want it to feel like they were just like NPCs like they were just background characters who didn't do anything Mm -hmm. and so actually what I did in the first draft was I wrote down real names of kids that I used to teach just to sort of keep them straight in my mind and remember so that I could remember like oh yeah like this kid tends to yell like this kid is really interested in this topic like this kid sometimes has a hard time with new experiences and then I changed their names because I didn't want to actually like yeah uh make any of make any real people feel any kind of way Um, And then I did like change elements of their personalities and their description so that it was more of a composite of a lot of kids that I've known over the last like many, many years. And I think it's really well done. I mean, I'm always a little intimidated by that as a reader, because as a human being, I have trouble going into a situation where there's a bunch of new people and keeping everybody straight and learning names. And and so as a reader, I'm like, I don't even get to see the faces, but I, you know, I caught on 
right away. So I think I think you did a good job. Um, yeah. One of the things Annabelle does after she describes her classmates is is she she's she's thinking about her own identity a little bit, and she reflects that. Um, maybe what they thought about me were things I didn't even know about myself. Um, to, to what extent does, does Annabelle see or try to see herself or try to form her identity through the way that other people look at her? I don't think that she tries to change herself in order to get other people to see her a certain way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that she is at an age where she is suddenly very conscious of social dynamics. Yeah. And suddenly very conscious that not only is she observing her peers, but her peers are also observing her and that she is not the center of the universe. And that to her classmates, she is the secondary or tertiary character. And I don't want to say that like, that's a lesson that, that it's important for people to learn, but also I do think that it is often very useful to remember that you are the star of your story, but that you are at best a secondary character in everybody else's story. Yeah. Um, and she's also, you know, all, I wanna say that kids do this, but everyone does this. We learn the rules of the world by observing and by trying things out and making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And sixth grade is a great year for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you kind of hinted at this um, a little bit earlier, but, but Annabelle is really aware of the difference between this sort of suburban world that she lives in and then the big city, which in this case is, is Seattle. Um, you know, she's she's been into Seattle before, but like mostly on school trips. And then she goes in with with Bailey at one point. But can you can you talk about how her her awareness of of sort of the proximity of of this large and in her eyes, I think progressive city forms her view of, of the community that she lives in and how those two kind of counterbalance each other, if you will. Yeah, that was very much drawn from just my childhood. I grew up about 20 miles north of Seattle mm -hmm. uh, in between a few different towns. I didn't grow up in like Linwood or Alderwood or Mill Creek, but I grew up sort of around that area. And I hated it there. My family moved there when I was five years old from Chicago. So my mom and dad always talked about Chicago as being the city. And so I had this awareness that there were cities and that there were other ways of life, but we went to Seattle only very occasionally and only really as tourists to go to like Peg's Place Market or the you know Pacific Science Center or whatever. And so I knew that there was more than just you know, my neighborhood, which was, you know, you get off the highway at the Walmart and then you turn before you hit the McDonald's. And I knew that there was more out there, but I didn't know how to access it. And I felt this sort of like frantic energy of desperately wanting to see what that more is, but not knowing how. And then of course I moved to New York city when I was 18 and just, you know, I went to Barnard on the upper West side and took the subway down, you know, to the village or times square whenever I could. So I got out by moving to New York, but as soon as I moved to New York, I met people from Seattle who seemed extremely cool. And then I got mad that I left Seattle before realizing how interesting it really was. Yeah. yeah. I just, I found that, that very interesting, the, the awareness of, of a kid that age. Cause I think when I was that age, I don't, I don't know that I had that awareness of the difference between, you know, where I lived and say a much bigger city. I was aware of other bigger cities, but I didn't, I didn't feel on a personal level. I think the way Annabelle does. Um, I love the way she personalizes it. I just remember feeling trapped. Yeah. Um, so Annabelle is uh, another choice you've made about her is that she's an only child. And as, she, as you write, she has no grandparents, no uncles, aunts, or cousins. Um, and to me, I feel like as a result of that, it feels like there's almost a little bit more pressure on her to be like a, a peer to her parents rather than just a, a, a child. Why, why did you choose to make her this only child who's who's really whose only family are the, are the parents that she lives with? Well, two points. One, I, I think that there's three answers to that question. Quest, answer number one is that she actually does have grandparents and an uncle and cousins but we don't find that out till much later. And there is a reason why she did not know about them. Yeah. Um, so in many ways, this isolation was something crafted by, it was both crafted by her mother and father and also forced upon her mother and father. Um, 
And then also she couldn't really have a sibling because then the entire plot arc would fall apart because it was established that her father did not especially like being the gestational parent. Yeah. It is established that her mother could not get pregnant. And if they adopted a kid, that would raise a lot of questions for her that would probably have this information come out sooner. So just from like a plot perspective, that was necessary. Um, and then also, honestly, another part of that is that I'm still working on my writing skills and I am not convinced that I could juggle a main character and her best friend slash love interest and also her classmates and a new teacher and also parents and then siblings. Those are more characters to write about. Yeah. I don't know if I'm that good yet. I think that's a really good point that maybe we don't say often enough as writers that that sometimes you know, we want to focus on certain characters. And so we we intentionally either underwrite or eliminate, um, you know, whether I can think of in one of my novels where I really underwrote the parents and didn't have them show up much at all, because that's not what it was supposed to be about. I want you to, I want you to look over here. Yeah, and so to me, that's, you know, it's a way of sort of guiding the readers. Like, this is where we want you to look. Um, we, this is not a novel about sibling relationships. This is a novel yeah. about friendship, about about a lot of things, but not not about that. But I, but I think some, sometimes we're afraid to say that out loud. You know, so, no, oh, no, I'm in there. Like, you know? I mean, also like this was a second book that I wrote as part of a two book deal where I had, and it was my first experience with like a real deadline and an editor telling me that I needed to write this book if I wanted to get money, which, you know, yeah. she didn't pressure me, but that's just how the business works. Yeah, yeah. So I was very conscious of like, all right, I got to get this done. I don't have time to give up and come back to it four years later, like I did for my first novel. So I decided to make it relatively easy on myself by setting it in a location that I was deeply familiar with, by then setting it in a school setting that I was deeply familiar with, and then by not giving Annabelle siblings. And like Bailey doesn't have siblings because then I would have to write a whole sibling character. Yeah. I did try to make it easy on myself by, you know, writing a, a book featuring characters and scenarios that have never been explored in middle grade. Super yeah. easy for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you, you sort of mentioned this before. I wasn't going to give this away because I didn't read the promotional material. I always just like dive right in and start reading the book. So I got to page 82 and there's like this, huge bombshell of information on, on page 82. Um, and, uh, but that brings me really to the question of, of structure. How did, how did you think about the book in terms of structure and how did you know it's time to like, okay, now we're going to, you know, drop the next bomb or, or sort of turn, turn in the next direction um, with, with a new piece of information, especially a piece of information that's new to, to Annabelle, the main character. So the structure changed dramatically between drafting and the writing of it. When I first started writing it, I thought that this book was going to take place over the course of a school year, that we would meet, that we would meet Bailey in September, that dad's reveal wouldn't happen until like November-ish. And then I guess it would be the winter holidays and then spring would happen and then everything would be wrapped up by June. And I started writing it and there was so much material in the first day of school. And then there was so much material in the second day of school that I couldn't imagine dragging that action out any further. So dad is sharing this with Annabelle, I think, you know, before the week is up, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, and that's when I decided like that was chapter eight and I did not want to write a 500 page novel <laughs> yeah. where a million things happen. I wanted to keep it tight and concise because that's part that's, I think that's important for especially realistic middle grade fiction. Yeah, yeah. So then I just had to restructure it and decide that instead of the story spanning September to June, it was going to end on national coming out day, which is yeah. in mid October. Yeah. And then there's going to be an epilogue in June where I sort of wrap everything up nicely, but that it's going to be a very, confined space. And then that worked for me because I like writing within confined spaces. My most recent novel, my most recent book that got announced was a board book for babies, which is 126 words. Wow. It goes through a full emotional journey of a full day in 126 words. So I love, awesome. I love concision. Yeah. I think that's a great challenge. I, you know, the, my middle grade book that's coming out is hopefully if all goes well, part of a trilogy in the first book, takes place over a period of about four days. And when I finished the second book, I went back and looked at it and realized I, it takes like barely 24 hours, you know, um, but but it does, I think it really does lend it, that genre lends itself to that sort of, um, not really boxing in, but, you know, Aristotle would approve, you know, keeping it keeping it to a limited um, time frame. One of the other things I think you do such a good job with in this book, uh, linguistically, especially, but but is capturing the, 
the physical and especially the emotional feeling of, of what it's like to be a sixth grader, um, having feelings that you don't really understand what they are or where they're coming from, um, some, some of which are, you know, manifesting themselves digestively and others are manifesting themselves different ways, you know, um, and I guess my, you know, the, the blunt question is, how did you research that? Did you, are you, are you remembering your own years? Are you, did you talk to kids who are in that age group? Do you remember, you know, you said you worked with fifth graders. Um, how, how do you sort of get into that emotional headspace? So a lot of it, I don't think that I could have written it if I hadn't worked in a school for so long. So a mm -hmm. lot of it was just observing my fifth graders and hearing them talk and like, you know, noticing that time of year when they all start to smell terribly because <laughs> yes. yeah, like they, they don't know about deodorant yet. Yep. And it's the worst like month of my teaching career is always that period when the fourth graders need deodorant, but don't know that yet. Yeah. Um, so it was a combination of that. And then also just tapping into my memories of what it was like, because in many ways, you know, I, I am a straight line. I am different from what I was at 11, but I am also still the same sack of meat. Yeah. And in many ways, those emotional experiences are still very close to the surface for me. I don't know if that's true for other people, yeah. but I like to say that bug my character into right to see is me when I'm sad. And Annabelle is me when I've had too much sugar. Which is <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, one of the other things I, I found in this book is you know, I'm about, I'm about to turn 60 here this year. I have gay friends, trans friends, non-binary friends and family. Um, but not only did I really enjoy reading this book, I actually learned a lot about the queer community that, that even through all of my efforts to learn as much as I can about that, that community, um, there was a lot here that, that was new to me. Um, and I wonder if you, are you, as you're writing, do you think at all about your adult readers um, as, you're, as you're crafting your story? Yeah, so I obviously want to center young people because that's who I'm writing for. And if yeah. kids don't like this book, then there's no point in me writing it. Right. Yeah. But I also know that adults will be reading it, both you know the adult gatekeepers and then also adults who just like reading middle grade. Yeah. And I wanted to include things in there that the adults would pick up on that kids wouldn't, but that kids wouldn't notice that they weren't getting something. I never would want a kid to feel like I was ignoring them, but I also wanted to put in little nods here and there for the adults to enjoy. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I, I worked as a, a playwright for kids for about 10 years and I always put in little jokes and things for the for the adult members of the audience that, I mean, I've had kids now, who, you know, some of our kids, they were third graders at the time. Some of them are in their mid twenties now and they'll come up and they'll go, oh, Mr. Lovett, I get that joke now. I understand what you were doing there. <laughs> you know? Well, we like to end every episode of Inside the Writer's Studio with the same 10 questions. Um, you should be able to answer each of them in just a, a few words or a sentence or so, but hopefully they'll give us a little insight into you and into your writing. So if you're ready, we will begin our speed round. All right. Okay. What word do you love to work into your writing? Circumlocution. Mm. What word do you hate to encounter in other people's writing? Transgender. Mm. Uh, where's your favorite place to write? Outpost Cafe, which doesn't exist anymore. Oh. Where could you never write? In a extremely boring, empty, quiet room all by myself with nobody around anywhere. Mm -hmm. To what rule of grammar do you pay least attention? Commas. Mm. What was the first book you remember reading? Oh, uh, Old Hat, New Hat by the Berenstain Bears or yeah. the humans behind them. Right. Um, what are you reading now? Oh, uh, oh, it's called, it's in my backpack. It's called <laughs> The Burning Something. It's a novel about the Rosenberg oh, execution yeah. from the perspective of Nixon, mm -hmm. question mark. Um, what book would you like to have written? Oh, no, I don't need my colleagues getting mad at me for saying I want to steal their ideas. <laughs> okay. Um, what sort of book would you like to write but probably never will? Basically different kinds of fruit, but for grownups. Mm -hmm. And finally, what would you like to hear a reader tell you? I don't think about it that way. That's okay. That's a good enough answer. This has been Inside the Writer's Studio. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett. And my guest today has been Kyle Lukoff, whose middle grade novel, Different Kinds of Fruit, is available wherever books are sold. Kyle, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Charlie.
Inside the Writer's Studio is sponsored by Bookmarks, a literary nonprofit that runs the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas and operates a community gathering place and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. To find out more about Bookmarks and all its programs, visit www.bookmarksnc.org. Inside the Writer's Studio is proud to be affiliated with Libro FM. Unlike other audiobook platforms, Libro FM supports your local independent bookstore. Whether you buy a single book or, like me, a monthly subscription, you can link your account to your local store or to Bookmarks to support literary community. For a special two-for-one offer, go to Libro.fm and use the discount code WRITERS. If you've enjoyed Inside the Writer's Studio, please consider leaving a rating or review online at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Inside the Writer's Studio posts new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. In our next episode, I'll be talking to Lauren McBrayer about her new novel, Like a House on Fire. Until then, thanks for listening, and may you read with wonder and write with passion. Thank you.